It is good to see you this afternoon. I'm looking forward to being able to fellowship with you in the Word of God. And I just thank God for the blessed privilege to be able to stand before you this afternoon. I definitely want to bring greetings from the unmatched name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who, who is alive and well today. I thank God for the ministry of the Holy Spirit, how he continues to minister to the hearts of his pastors through the unadulterated, inerrant word of God. And I have no authority. I have no power outside of the things that I will say as long as the things that I say are consistent with what he has said in the scriptures. If I if I diverge or go away from the scriptures, please do me the favor of walking out with your finger erect and saying, I will not listen. Amen. Amen. However, if what I say is consistent with what we see in the scriptures, do me a favor, the favor of submitting your thoughts uh, to his thoughts, because his thoughts are the best thoughts you'll ever think. I think it was A.W. Tozer in a work years and years ago who said that the greatest thought that you ever think is the thought that you think about God. Amen. So the knowledge of the holy is still true. And so as we pray to God, I want you to begin turning in your Bibles uh, to Psalm 1. And we want to allow Psalm 1 to massage our hearts in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your, your grace. Because you are a sovereign God, I guess I could say that your grace is sovereign. And so, Lord, I thank you that by your grace, we're able to stand. We're able to have our hope. And we're able to have our peace, our confidence, our faith, and our joy and our security in the grace of Jesus Christ. I thank you that the spirit of Christ who's one with you, Father, has drawn us into yourself and given us great hope in the gospel and even hope in one another because we know that the image of God is ever present in the lives of everyone who bears the name of Christ and even those who do not know you. And so, Father, I pray that as you touch the hearts of your pastors. I pray, Father, that people will simply see a man who has been attracted to Jesus Christ through the spirit of Christ, through the word of God, and who is motivated by love to see you transform our hearts so that we can transform a world for your glory and for our good. Father, please, Lord, touch us now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Psalm chapter 1, reading from the English Standard Version, and you'll see these words rendered. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. For a little while this afternoon, I want to talk to you from this thought. Associations matter. Associations matter. As a part of the mission board staff, I have the privilege as we prepare for annual conv convention and every mission board staff member has the privilege of traveling 
all around the state of Kentucky to attend associational meetings. We can travel at any moment in time at the drop of a hat as soon as a pastor or a director of missions asks us to come and to talk about what your mission board is doing in order to penetrate lostness for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. The beauty about being a part of this dynamic team is that you begin to realize that the mission board will will impact any church and any pastor because we recognize that every association within the state of Kentucky matters. And because an association matters, we know that churches matter. And because churches matter, we know that, that pastors matter. And because pastors matter, we know that communities matter. And because communities matter, we know that every individual who bears the image of God matters. And so when we think about engaging local pastors and we think about encouraging pastors, we think about encouraging these pastors understanding that we live in a day and age that has turned its heart away from the true and living God. We live in a day and age where individuals find themselves questioning whether or not submit, surrendering their thoughts to his thought is the greatest thought that they could ever think. And so as these individuals are questioning submitting their thoughts to his thought, uh, our goal as pastors is to remind a local church not to lose hope. And so our associations matter because people matter. And because people matter, where we find ourselves on a daily basis is telling one another that if you're going to do what God has called you to do, you must submit yourself completely to the absolute truth of the word of Scripture. If you're going to be able to encourage your church and to encourage yourself in the faith and to restore a lost and dying world, you must make sure on a daily basis, and I must make sure, that we have been restored back to truth. And being restored back to truth knows that there is only one truth in a world that is full of competing truths. And the one truth is that a sovereign God of the universe, the supreme ruler of the universe, has created this world and said at the point of creation, after he created the world, that it was all good. But we also know that as a result of sin, that the fall has entered into this world. And fall is now in the world when we see image bearers we see image bearers recognizing that yes they are defaced but not completely erased but they are in need of his grace God has called you pastor and God has called me in order to find our nourishment and our stability in his word so as we as gospel forebears We as gospel prognosticators, we as men who take the gospel of Jesus Christ into lost and dying situations, we realize that we, if we're going to take that gospel into a lost and dying situation, cannot find ourselves dying from the inside out. You notice I said that associations matter, and I started thinking first and foremost about the associations around the state of Kentucky. But as you read Psalm 1, you're going to see that the psalmist is going to engage a different type of association. And the association that the psalmist is speaking of is the association between the godly and the ungodly. He's going to show that there are two ways that an individual can choose to live. A person can choose to walk with those who are righteous. A person can choose to walk in the way of the unrighteous. But the end result for those who choose to walk in the way of the righteous, as we'll see in the text, is is prosperity that is in Jesus Christ. Prosperity that's found in the only true and living God. Prosperity, not like the prosperity gospel, but a prosperity that as you read the text, you'll discover is that when everyone is throwing in the towel and they're feeling like it's time to pack up and and run out, we can stand firm because of what the one who 
has died in our place, has done on our behalf. We can stand firm, not in our own authority, but and not in our own strength, but we can stand firm because you and I, brothers and sisters, have learned how to walk the way of the wise. In fact, one of the reasons why I love the Psalms and I love Psalm 1 is because when you begin to read the Psalms, you recognize that Psalm 1 opens up. This book of Psalms begins with a pronouncement of blessings on all who respond in fidelity to the God of the covenant. It opens up with this pronouncement of blessing because you, if you are a believer, even though you are not necessarily a part of Israel and Israel's economy, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a part of Abraham's seed. And so you have experienced covenant fidelity through Jesus Christ. And you have also experienced covenant loyalty through Jesus Christ. So that means that you, if you name the name of Jesus Christ, pastor, you are a covenant recipient. And so as a covenant recipient, you begin to read the Psalms, understanding that Psalm 1 begins honoring the God of covenant because the God of covenant who has promised us that he is faithful can never tell a lie. And he's going to show us that there are two ways that you can live. You can walk in the way of the righteous or you can walk in the way of the unrighteous. But the way of the righteous will bring biblical prosperity. But the way of the unrighteous will bring destruction. And so the psalmist opens up talking about what it means to be a person who is wise, who walks in wisdom. He opens up explaining that if you and I are going to be individuals who walk in wisdom, we begin to understand that wisdom means that we know how to use the right information at the right time in the right way. (laughs) He says that if we're people of wisdom, then we understand that information, when we engage the unadulterated word of God without application, results from the wrong motivation. Now, do you understand the situation? (laughs) That information without application results from the wrong motivation. So as we begin to hear the sovereign God talk about covenant loyalty through, through, as we read the New Testament, through Jesus Christ. But in this particular economy, the covenant loyalty of Yahweh, Yahweh is going to say to Israel, you need to be wise. Don't be as fools. Don't live as fools. You need to become wise. And if we're going to be people who are wise, the first thing that we must do as individuals who are wise, we must consistently engage God's word, saying to ourselves that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. You see, there's some people when they begin to open up the Bible, beloved, And I pray this isn't your testimony, but there are some individuals, when they begin to read the Bible, they read the Bible and they begin to say things like, let me determine whether or not this is true. And they stand over the Bible and they read the Bible saying, you know what, I don't know if I like this verse. Let me take that part out. That is the way of the foolish. There are other people who do not necessarily stand over the Bible, but they stand against the Bible. And they stand against the Bible to such an extent that they say that all the book is just a myth. There's no reason for believing this book. This book is archaic. It has nothing to say to me today. That, beloved, is the way of the foolish. But we as leaders in the 21st century are called not to stand over the Bible or against the Bible. We don't even simply stand on the Bible, but we stand underneath the Bible. We stand underneath the scriptures so that as we begin to read the scriptures, we're saying, God, if I want to experience peace, 
If I want to know a sense of security, I can't look to myself. I only can look to you because as I surrender my thoughts to what you're saying in the word, I'll know peace. Not only will I know peace, I'll be able to restore people towards or back to that peace. And so the psalmist is saying to us, if you're going to be wise, you must become a person who applies the right information at the right time in the right way. And so there are three things I think that this text is tailored to teach us that I love most when I read it. The first thing that I see as you read verse one, if we're going to learn how to pursue godly living in a godless world. And understand that our association to the word of God matters and the way that we relate to the world matters. If we are going to learn how to associate properly to God's word and to the world, we must discern the slippery slope. Notice what the psalmist says. The psalmist opens up and the psalmist says, blessed is the man. Now, I'll be honest, when my my brother Nathan was preaching, I I was a bit afraid because Nathan said, you know, uh, when he was in preparation, he he, he thought that at one point he would have to quote something from the Latin or the Septuagint. (laughs) And I'm about to do that, Nathan, so forgive me, bro. But it's amazing because when you, when you read Psalm 1 and you start to juxtapose the Hebrew Bible and the Latin Psalter with the Septuagint, you see three different phrases being used, but the phrases all have, connote the same idea. In the Hebrew Bible, you see the phrase there being utilized for blesses the man, ash rai ha'ish. When you look at it in the Latin Psalter, it's amazing because you see the phrase beatus weir. But when you look at it in the Greek or the Septuagint, you see this phrase makarios aner. And you start to put these phrases together and you say, God, what are you saying as I read the Hebrew Bible? Well, here's what he's saying. That when he says, blessed is the man, he is saying that blessed, meaning this, the intensity of the blessing results in a person who has overwhelming joy and satisfaction in a God that is immovable. Oh, I ain't making this up. Get back in your Hebrew, amen. It is, it is a person who has overwhelming joy in a God that is immovable. This person realizes that their joy is not based on their circumstances because circumstances what? They change. Yeah, somebody talking to me. That's good for a black preacher, brother. <laughs> but circumstances are subject to change. They're bound to change. And people oftentimes say that we normally base our happiness on our happenings. But what happens when your happenings change? Is your joy then fickle? But if your joy is based on covenant loyalty of a sovereign God, then you have your stability not in your circumstances, but your stability is in the testimony of the one who is wise. And this is our God. Because our thoughts are not his thoughts unless our thoughts align up with the scripture. And if our thoughts are not aligning up with scripture, friends, put your finger up. Walk out. Put your finger up and walk out. And so as you discern the slippery slope, what the psalmist is saying there is it is blessed. But the blessedness, you have to understand, is not deserved. Did y'all hear me, beloved? This blessedness is a gift of God. This blessedness that the psalmist is talking about, the intensity of the blessedness, is because the psalmist understands that what he experiences from God, this joy and this excitement and this overwhelming joy, not in his circumstances, but in the one who is stable, is based upon the fact that this God has given the gift. And so all of the Psalter begins on this foundation of the covenant loyalty of a sovereign God. And the covenant loyalty of a sovereign God reminds you, covenant recipient, that we are blessed. 
They're like telling five of y'all, touch five people and say that you're blessed. Because you are. If you're a believer in Christ, you are blessed. When you see yourself on every morning and you look in the mirror, you are blessed. And the psalmist says, blessed is the man that walketh not first in the counsel of the ungodly. And then he goes on to say, in the counsel of the wicked, or nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. He begins to explain that this slippery, slippery slope oftentimes takes place when we forget the fact that the world is against our God. And we begin to rest in our circumstances and not rest in the sovereignty of God. You see, the covenant loyalty should, be, uh, should produce covenant, covenantal joy. We rest in his magnificent promise, not in our ministerial positions, because your ministerial position can what? It can change. People can hear a sermon on one Sunday, and it's the best thing since sliced bread. Oh, I love my pastor. That was a great word, pastor. You spoke to my heart. The next Sunday, you hear... Man, the, the, the pastor study must have been, oh, he had a tough week. <laughs> but if your happiness is based on the, 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 what you hear from the crowd, then, friend, you're always going to be tossed to and fro by every wind of compliment. But when you look at yourself and you see yourself as blessed because the sovereign God of the universe has called you to become his child. And then he defines or he explains to you how to discern the slippery slope, friend, that creates joy. Because this slippery slope, as you see, he says you begin to listen to the counsel of the wicked. In other words, if you walk with the ungodly, you will eventually walk like the ungodly. That simply means that their decisions will become your decisions. And one of the things that God is teaching me as I think about restoration and being able to, to live and to serve well as a, as a, as a pastor, as a, as a leader within the state of Kentucky, sometimes I base my decisions on how individuals who defy the word of God are responding to me. Let me show you what I mean. If you deny or question the authority of scripture, you don't have a high view of scripture, and every time I hear you or you're sending me an email or you're talking about some decision that I have made and you question the authority of scripture, then I'm like, thank you. I think I'm doing well. If you question the authority of scripture and you then question the decisions that are being made when people are saying, I only want to do what the Bible tells me to do because the way and the counsel of the wicked leads to destruction. And then you begin to question their ways and and your decisions look more like the decisions of those who do not surrender their thoughts to the authority of scripture. Then, Then thank you. You see, Pastor, I think that's a good thing because some criticism is good. If you're being criticized by someone who no longer believes in the authority of Scripture, who no longer trusts the Word of God, then that is a great criticism. And when you receive it, you should say, praise God. See, if you walk with the ungodly, you will eventually walk like the ungodly. In other words, their decisions will become your decisions. Then he says, nor stands in the way of sinners. See, if you stand in the way of sinners, you will eventually stand with sinners. And before you know it, you will begin to champion the very cause of the ungodly. That's heartbreaking. Because I know when I say that you champion the very cause of the ungodly, I know that we are all sinners saved by the miraculous grace of God. 
But when you begin to champion the cause of the ungodly, what what the writer, what the psalmist is saying is that the voice of the ungodly, actually you begin to parrot the voice of the ungodly and you're no longer saying what the scripture says, slippery slope. And as you parrot the voice of the ungodly, the next thing you know, you actually go to another level. First you are walking, then you are standing, and then you begin to sit. sit. The slippery slope, slope says that you sit with the scornful or with the mockers. So you begin to mock the very thing that you should be champion. You begin to mock truth. And the next thing the world says is, bravo, bravo, bravo. Discern the slippery slope, brothers and sisters. Because when we rest on the authority of Scripture, God is going to protect the, the, the heart of the spiritual leader. But we must rest on the authority of Scripture, knowing that the covenant loyalty of God does not change. Secondly, the psalmist begins to explain to us. The psalmist says here, but his delight, listen. Is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. And he is like a a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. See, in verses 2 through 4 and verses 2 through 3, he begins to show us then, I believe, that we should not only discern the slippery slope, but we should delight in revelatory hope. Delight in revelatory hope. You see, notice now, he says there, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. The word but there is translating a Hebrew particle, ki im, and that Hebrew particle typically restricts the preceding material. So it restricts verse 1, walking with the ungodly, standing with the ungodly, sitting in the seat of the scornful. Now this particle here is going to restrict that reads but. In other words, it's saying keep out. So that when you read the but here, it is literally speaking with an slowly mows over the passage, which invariably causes one's heart to be warmed and one's will to be strengthened. When one meditates, when you and I meditate on scripture, it causes our hearts to become warmed and our wills to be strengthened. But if we fail to consistently meditate on scripture day and night, your heart will not become warm. Your heart will become cold. 
And your will will not become strengthened. Your will will collapse. But the psalmist is saying that the person who is seeking to walk in wisdom, understanding the beautiful covenant loyalty of God, is seeking to meditate, to mull over the word of God daily so that we can find our heart strengthened. And you know the difficulty that I discover in ministry is that oftentimes I got so much on my plate that I think memorizing scripture is good for my 11-year-old, my 8-year-old, and my 7-year-old. But the Lord showed me that if you want your heart to be warm, Curtis, and if you want your heart, to, your will to be strengthened, Curtis, no, memorizing scripture wasn't something you did when you got saved 20 years ago. Memorizing scripture is something that you got to do on a daily basis in order to strengthen the will and your resolve. You know, I know we're at a pastor's conference, but is anybody going to break out for dinner and talk about, hey, man, what, what are you memorizing in the word of God? Are we going to talk about buildings and bank accounts and baptisms? All those things are good, buildings, bank accounts, and baptisms, I get it. But the question is, how are you allowing the word of God to massage your heart? How are you allowing the word of God to strengthen you? How am I doing this? Because if we're going to make it the long haul, that's the only way the psalmist says we're going to be able to do it. Feels good when I can look out and see a pastor that I get with on a monthly basis and And he and I have decided to memorize Romans chapter 12. It feels good that the reason why we want to memorize Romans chapter 12 is because we want our hearts to be warmed by the word of God and we want our wills to be strengthened by the word of God so that as we are dealing with ungodly criticism from the world, we'll be able to handle it with compassionate truth or convictional kindness to borrow from Russ Moore and we will handle it in such a way that God will be glorified and we will prove that we're men who are walking in wisdom. It says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and upon his law does he meditate day and night. Hear the word of the Lord, beloved. Matthew 24, verses 10 through 13 in the Olivet Discourse, when I hear about not delighting in the, in the word of the Lord, here's what typically comes to my mind. Hear the word. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. The lawlessness, the lawlessness will be increased and the love of many will grow cold. There's only one way the psalmist is saying we can avoid that in our hearts and that's meditating on the scripture day and night being restored daily in the word of God, allowing the word of God to mull over in our minds daily so that as our wills are being strengthened, we seek to do his will and not our own will. When I look at this, And I think about this passage, I begin to find myself a bit sorrowful. And the reason why I find myself a bit sorrowful is because as I listen to verses 3 and 4, and he begins to use the, the comparison of this man being like a tree planted in the streams of water, that yields forth fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and all that he does he prospers but the wicked are not so but are like a chaff that the wind drives away 
I become a bit sorrowful because I recognize that when we as pastors, when we as spiritual leaders see someone who has clearly stopped meditating on scripture, the first thing that we want to do is to attack them with our words and not to come, come alongside them with grace and truth. And to point them back towards scripture. And to point them back towards love. And to point them back towards truth. And if they decide after we have come to them with the word and after we have come with them saying you are on the way of folly. You are going down the road of folly. Please, it is destructive. It will destroy you. And if they then turn a deaf ear, we have done our job because we let them know that the way of the wicked will perish But I'm at pain when I see in our lives not a desire first to see individuals restored back to truth and back to grace, back to wisdom. We have to help people to draw from the well of the word because the well of the word is the only thirst quencher. We know that the spirituality of the word means that the word will sustain and not simply stagger us. The word will develop us and not simply deplete us. The word will comfort and confront and not simply condemn and criticize. The word will give consistent nourishment unto our souls. And so we want individuals to believe his word. Lastly, verses four through six. Once we've discerned the slippery slope, secondly, we delight in our revelatory hope, finding our sustenance in the word of God. Thirdly or lastly, we disassociate ourselves from destructive worldviews. In verse 5, he says, Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. When I hear this, I always see someone and I picture myself driving down the highway about to approach a bridge. And as I'm about to approach this bridge with my family in the car, I I picture someone with a sign up saying, stop. The bridge is out. As soon as I'm driving down the highway with my family and I look to my right and I see this person on the side of the road with a sign that says, stop, the bridge is out. The first thing that I'm going to do as a husband, as a leader within the confines of my car, thinking about my wife and thinking about my children, I'm going to say, I think it ought to be wise to stop, (laughs) right? At that point, I'm not going to contemplate, oh, could this be an ambush? Perhaps that sign is simply from a person who has someone else who's waiting to ambush us. I'll just keep driving. No, at that point, I know there's a bridge over the horizon. I see this sign. I need to make a decision that if I keep going in this direction it and the bridge is out, it is destructive and my family will perish, I must believe. And I need to stop. The only thing that causes me to contemplate whether or not this person with the sign can be trusted is because they are a fallible creature. But when I read the word of God, I read the word of God and you read the word of God. And the word of God is saying that you must hear the warning sign that if you are not allowing the scriptures to dominate your thoughts and your decisions, you will eventually be destroyed. And because the word of God emanates from the mind of God. 
and men wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, that means that I can trust that the, what I'm reading in the Word is absolutely trustworthy. And for me to go left is to be destroyed. I say, I'm going to surrender to you, Lord. You have the best decision. The bridge is out. We don't need to be destroyed. See, Pastor, you're looking at a man who 20 years ago found himself as a young college student. I didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ. I was actually a professed Muslim. And in the fall of 1993, one of the most difficult things happened in my existence. My grandmother, who I love dear in eastern Arkansas, died after complications for, with Alzheimer's disease. Except that was September 1993. Shortly thereafter, my dad in October 1993 divorced my mother after 23 years of marriage. Because he told his mother when I was 10 years old that as long as she had breath, namely my grandmother that he would never divorce my mother. But as soon as she passed away and died, he divorced her. Shortly after that, I was trying to deal with the pains of my life with my fraternity brothers, dealing with pain like people typically deal with pain. And I chose revelry. I chose fraternal ties. I chose, I chose immorality. And what God did for me in the fall of 1993 was he placed me in enough pain so that I fell straight on my back in January 1994. And you were looking at a man in 1994 as a 20-year-old college student who did not know hope, who did not know the covenant loyalty and the beauty of a sovereign God. And in January of 1994, I remember getting up. Walking and crying, I had tried to do a Muslim prayer and I said, no one is listening to me. And I got up off of my knees and I started walking around my apartment and I saw this little red Gideon Bible. Say praise God for the Gideons. And I saw this little red Gideon Bible and I opened up this little red Gideon Bible and I read Psalm 1 and it said, Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight shall be in the law of the Lord. And upon this law does he meditate day and night and he shall be planted like a tree in the midst of streams of living water and whatever he does shall not prosper but the ungodly are not so for they are like chaff that shall not be able to and I kept reading that and by the time I got to verse 6 I had surrendered my heart to Jesus Christ and said Lord save me By the time I got to verse 6, I said, God, save me. And he did it. Because he, he exposed in my heart by his revelatory power the slippery slope. He says, here's where you're going. And he exposed in my heart by his revelatory power my only hope, which was in Jesus Christ. And then he told me, Curtis, you're going to make the long haul, it's going to take the bar from Eugene Peterson, a long obedience in the same direction. Trust his word. He wants to restore us from the inside out. God bless you, brothers and sisters, as you live for him. <laughs>